Hello, hello, hello again. Dr. White here with your late week update looking up to this Memorial Day weekend ahead. So this video is going to be relatively short. I'm going to cover three things. One, the logistics of submitting your annotated bibliography. I am creating an assignment submission link and you do need to upload a Word doc to it just like last time. So do that. Your final submission will not be a reply to a Blackboard thread, I promise. Uh, point two, uh, as far as the posts go, everybody's keeping up with it, so great job there. Um, I am collecting those and knocking, you know, keeping track of who's doing what. Um, in terms of the schedule, uh, your next uh, due date is your research notes that are due on um, Friday, May 26th. So in terms of the annotated bib introduction, what we're really just looking for is a paragraph or two describing your research process, telling us about your research question, and maybe also um, commenting on which sources you think might be useful for which modules and how you might put them together to maybe create a um, scholarly project. So just thinking like, how can I use each one as something background knowledge, as something current events, as something a social science perspective or public health perspective, as something a technical perspective. Uh, so, okay, what I'm going to do now is turn to the inquiry questions, responses, and revisions. So take a second, pause the video, pull up the Blackboard discussion thread, and do Apple F, Control F, Edit Find, whatever floats your boat. Um, we're going to look at a couple of representative examples here. So uh, I'm going to try to bounce around over the course of the semester and mention different people's work once. Uh, I'm just, but at the same time, I am going to choose whoever's work I think best exemplifies the points that I'm trying to make. So for today, Sarah Coombs, congratulations. Uh, you are the lucky winner. Come on down for... You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. You too can win a... Canadian Rockies train ride or whatever the weird vacations are they give away these days. So uh, Sarah's topic is the obesity epidemic in America. Um, obviously it is a problem in America, although I would add it's a problem throughout the world and other places. Um, of course, it's fine to focus on America. That wasn't in any way a critique of that. Um, in fact, I think narrowing down a geographic area can be helpful because especially with obesity, which has a large uh, social and sometimes cultural dimension, um, geographic limitation can kind of help restrict some variables. So Sarah's looking at the American obesity epidemic and uh, how it's being attended to across healthcare fields. Um, Obese children, she writes, may face the effects of being overweight for years to come and list some of those uh, negative impacts. And so she's interested in researching causes and contributing factors of childhood obesity. Sarah, that is uh, a very uh, big topic. So I'm still, that's why I chose yours, by the way, and that it's an appropriate topic. It's a good topic, but it's big. And we're going to look at how um, your partners in crime have encouraged you to narrow it down a little bit. Um, I do think that looking at how the rate has changed over the past 10 years is one productive way to narrow the focus, uh, and also looking at current prevalence that takes us to a contemporary moment. Um, so limiting chronologically. Um, of course, the one risk you run there is looking at kind of you're going to risk kind of summarizing like recent trends rather than actually analyzing them. And we want to be sure that we're focused here on, uh, not in the annotated bid necessarily, but that further down the road, we can analyze and draw on some data rather than just, um, summarizing. Uh, I do think though that Sarah, your questions, for instance, is childhood obesity equally distributed among racial, social, and economic classes. We know that it's not, um, how do they differ among geographic regions? We know that it does predominantly along those same lines of race and uh, class. Uh, genetic factors certainly I think is a whole category that uh, could receive um, all of your attention, frankly. That's a big topic in and of itself. Um, and you're casting a really wide net there too and you even look at things like uh, maternal 
of pregnancy practices and advertising. So great job casting a wide net here with a lot of different ways to narrow down that topic. Um, and we do need to narrow it. So let's take a look at uh, Joy's response to Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I think that you chose a really interesting topic. I agree. Um, I was thinking about researching nutrition and bone health, so I looked at obesity. Uh, I think focusing on children uh, might be used to predict the likelihood they'll be obese adults. Sure. Um, interesting subpopulation to look at because of the level of control that children have over their food intake. That is a really great point, Joy. So let's all stop and think about Joy's feedback there. That with children, there's a lot of control over food intake. Parents, of course, have a lot of control, but yet children can also be ridiculously picky eaters. I went through a phase where my only after-school snack that I would eat would be microwavable french fries, and I wondered why I was a pudgy, awkward kid at the age of 11. Okay, moving on. Um, so Joy's feedback uh, goes on. Uh, I think specifically looking at the causes and contributing factors is a good choice because it's not purely medical, public health oriented. Um, I would suggest narrowing your research and focusing on biological, medical predisposing factors or the socioeconomic and cultural influences. Um, Joy, that's tremendously a helpful feedback. Um, one thing I might make uh, is that for the annotated bib, since we are trying to narrow and also kind of cast a wide net, um, yeah, you're, I think either of those are kind of helpful umbrellas that you want to expand from. Um, maybe, uh, Sarah, maybe you come back to the other one later on for the public writing, but I think, I think Joy's really right that you probably want to focus on one or the other here. Um, Shandy also had some helpful feedback, um, particularly when she asks about uh, proving that there is inequality and dig deeper into why that inequality exists and how things like grocery stores, park space, and recreational opportunities might, in underserved areas might contribute to uh, childhood obesity. So I think athletic participation is a great idea too. Um, and of course, I'll add my own kind of pet peeve here, which would be uh, in terms of education policies. Of course, there is most uh, in underserved populations, most of your children are going to be in public schools. Public schools, of course, since uh, 2000 and No Child Left Behind. Uh, have been subject to more testing, standardized testing, and oh, did I mention more testing? More time in school, less time for recess, less resources for after school activities, uh, or if there are after school activities, instead of go run around the ball field a few times, it's um, your math test scores aren't good enough, so we're going to practice fractions. Um, not to knock fractions, they're useful. But um, just other ways to look at it. So I think um, Shandy and Joy, that was some really, really excellent feedback. And now let's look at what Sarah did with it, which is part of the point, is that Sarah did good things with it. Uh, so she mentions that she had worked in hospitals and she saw uh, how the negative health outcomes in adults with obesity were particularly uh, bad. Uh, and so to narrow, I'm going to focus on if it's more how childhood obesity is prevalent in some demographic areas more than others and look into the reasons for those disparities. So Sarah, that is an excellent choice. I think, it, you know, it speaks to my heart per certainly, but it's also a topic that has a lot of different perspectives to it. Um, it's a topic that will lend itself well to module five, the public writing, but more to the point, um, even with the scholarly stuff, you're going to have really dense material. Um, public health is a great field for this in that it's, it's it's a little bit easier to write about than the scientific aspect because it does reduce a little bit of the burden on the technical side, um, even while maintaining intense focus on specificity and data integrity and research practices. So it's completely scholarly um, and somewhat technical. Certainly it's informed by, there's a lot of statistics in public health, but you're not translating uh, biochem, put it that way. So great job with narrowing your topic, Sarah. Really tremendous feedback from Joy and Shandy on that. I want to look at one more uh, example here, um, which is uh, 
Joy, your question, uh, right under Sarah's. We're just looking at the same section of the discussion board thread here. And so Joy is working on the prevalence of stress fractures following various types of exercise, but now she wants to narrow in on the first stage of the healing process for lower limb stress fractures, uh, specifically the use of nerve blocks for pain management. Um, so Joy clearly has a strong grounding in this topic. And Joy, I apologize. I don't recall your particular background in it now, although I know that you mentioned it in your, um, well, I think you mentioned it in your introduction thread. Um, so Joy's particular questions, um, well, her second one, whether those suffering from these stress fractures can be generalized. Um, for instance, uh, adolescent or geriatric populations may have additional considerations um, and how nerve blocks might be, uh, how the practice of it might be changed. So, Joy, you're doing a great job of kind of coupling the technical side of it, um, with, which is the treatment side of it, with the, um, the social side of it, for lack of a better word, uh, populations and practices. Another way to say this is you're really, I think, doing a great job of putting together a discourse community with a community of practice concerns. So I think you're setting yourself up for a really rich, informed, productive project. And uh, let's see what Jen says to Joy. So Jen's response, um, Joy, I'm sorry, Jen agrees that Joy did a great job narrowing her topic with nerve blocks and uh, again supports the decision to uh, explore different types of lower limb stress fractures. Um, Jen raises a very, very, very good question though. One thing I might suggest looking into before creating your annotated bibliography is how many studies there are specifically on lower limb stress fractures treated with nerve blocks as uh, a lower limb stress fracture is a very specific injury. So Jen, that is a very appropriate question to consider. Um, and let's see, so Joy has revised it. I'm interested in the use of nerve blocks as a substitute for opioids for individuals requiring pain management for orthopedic injuries, specifically stress fractures. Uh, she relays her, uh, her unfortunate recent experience of a compression fracture. That sounds incredibly painful. Um, additionally, it is relevant to my future career. Absolutely. And PT, um, on opioids, sure. So, Joy, that's a really interesting way of narrowing this in that you went from a really focused, specific, narrow question to something that's um, a little more inclusive by bringing in um, opioids and nerve blocks as an alternative. Um, so that's certainly casting a still very specific but a different way to approach this question. Um, and also looking at it, um, maybe you didn't say this, but I'm reading it between the lines here in terms of um, PT and what role physical therapists might play. Um, obviously, they're not um, prescribers here, but what role uh, the medical treatment, uh, the drug treatment rather, might play with respect to physical therapy. So that's another community of practice you could look at there. Um, and of course, in terms of different kind of injuries as well. So Joy, I think you did a really, um, I think you did a really smart thing, which is you followed Jen's suggestion in opening your topic a bit, but you did it in a way that's still limited enough to allow for really focused inquiry into some really specific questions. And these can all be addressed from both the kind of um, pharmaceutical, technical, scientific. Um, yes, I know I'm using those terms interchangeably. I apologize. But from that perspective, while also looking at it from a COP uh, perspective and how this stuff all plays out. So for those of you whose work I didn't specifically address, which is most of you, um, the trends that we've identified here are how to narrow your topic productively while also maintaining a relatively high level of uh, source use. So for instance, um, when it comes to Joy's topic, Joy, I don't think you're going to run the risk, for instance, of getting like summarized reductive sources that aren't particularly complex. You're working at a high level and I think pretty sure that provided you work within the library resources, use the peer review filter, um, check the publication information to make sure it's a peer reviewed, at least editorial reviewed um, publication. I think you're in great shape. 
Uh, and for those of you, the rest of you, try to do the same thing. In terms of Sarah's topic, um, Sarah had such a big topic that I think, again, I know some of you also have big topics like that, and you might use some of those social aspects, those demographics, those public health ways to kind of narrow your focus a little bit while still maintaining a high level of quality in your sources. One of the risks of having a huge topic is um, getting sources that aren't sufficiently technical to sustain uh, critical inquiry through modules three and four particularly. So if you have any questions on any particular sources, uh, feel free to email me, attach a PDF, and I'll give it a quick skim. Um, the big thing to remember is that this work does have to sustain you for the next two modules, three modules, uh, so the work has to be sufficiently complex. Uh, what that means is we want stuff with a lot of citations, we want stuff that looks scholarly, or at least community of practice oriented, and we want to see that raw material. We want to see graphs, charts, tables, or um, citations, I mean both ideally, uh, depending on the source of course. So keep that in mind as you're assembling your bibliography. Uh, you'll hear from me next on Monday when I'll offer some thoughts on some of the bibliographies assembled. And have a great Memorial Day weekend. Enjoy those top 500 rock blocks on your local classic rock radio. I know I will. Have a good one.